All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Again, welcome, good afternoon, and welcome to the HFMA Colorado webinar series. We do wanna take a moment to first recognize all of our annual business partners who not only provide financial support to our chapter, but also share their knowledge and expertise through speakers and presentations. Their support allows us to operate our chapter and bring our members quality education and resources. We hope you will take a look at them first when your organization needs services or support. Um, that was a really quick reminder that popped up. Sorry, it went a little fast. That certification is now included in your membership. So if you've been considering getting certified, reach out to the chapter. Um, it's all inclusive in your membership price now. And we often have study boot camps and things like that. So reach out, let us know if you're in interested in getting certified. For today's webinar, we will be using the chat box located in the bottom right hand of your screen um, to address questions. We can try and address as we go, but we'll also have um, some question and answer time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. So make sure you put your questions in the chat box. A link to download the presentation is also included already in that chat box. Um, it was also emailed out, but if you need it, please reach out. We can get that to you. For today's webinar, the future of the healthcare workforce in the intelligence age, it is being provided by one of our silver sponsors, Olive. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Matt Kalina. Matt is currently the national strategy lead at Olive, a healthcare artificial intelligence company that is the market leader in developing and deploying AI workforce programs for hospitals and health systems. Matt is a solution and product enthusiast with a passion for disruptive emerging technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the future of work and startups. With a focus in healthcare operations over the last five years, Matt has developed AI programs alongside some of the nation's leading healthcare providers to drive overall business transformation and strategic growth. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kalina. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna switch over and share my screen now. Um, I appreciate you all taking some time during your lunch break to join me today. Um, I'm joining you from a beautiful Courtyard Marriott here in Long Island, New York. Um, I'm actually based out of uh, uh, Austin, Texas. Um, recently moved there, but um, I'm gonna talk to you guys today about the future of the healthcare workforce in the intelligence age. And feel free if there's any questions or comments that you all have to, to populate them in the chat. We'll try to jump and get into those um, as we're making it through the presentation, but we'll definitely be setting up some time at the end um, for us to address any questions. And, and if there's ones we don't get to, I will gladly follow up with all of you individually um, following the session. So uh, the future of the healthcare workforce in the intelligence age. Uh, it's a really sort of um, glamorous topic, I think. Um, there's I think now more than ever, we're creating more data than we can actively use. Um, and healthcare is one of the um, data assets that is most under leveraged. Uh, we collect the most information about the populations and people that we're serving. And there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to um, turn that data into intelligence that we put back into the system to help us provide better care for our communities. And there's a lot of things that we need to do um, and a lot of that is, is sort of thinking about the people aspect of this. Uh, mentally, how do we become more educated on the technology so it doesn't become so foreign, but also how do we help our staff and people around us overcome some of the things that, that are sometimes scary about adopting new technology. Um, so a little bit of background on myself. I mentioned that I live in Austin, Texas. Um, prior to joining the team at Olive, um, which I did about six and a half years ago, I actually worked in public policy um, for the state of Ohio looking at healthcare from the state government side. Um, and then since joining Olive, I had the unique opportunity to get my hands on some really interesting technology and really work with healthcare providers, uh, payers, really anyone in this healthcare, healthcare ecosystem, uh, sort of you know, pull apart the pieces of more complex technologies to find out how we really can operationalize them. I think oftentimes there's a bit of a uh, over promise and under performance that can happen when there's new technologies that are glamorous um, and, and there's sort of the, the shiny object in the room. And we've done a, a great job of partnering with different organizations on making a practical applications of 
technology that can sometimes seem like science fiction. And uh, we've had the unique opportunity to turn it more into science function with a lot of the partners that we work with. So I figured I'd give a little bit of a background and overview about Olive just to orient you all in case you're not familiar with who we are. Um, but Olive was founded in 2012. And our goal is to use technology to help shine a light on um, the challenges that healthcare is faced with and unleash over a trillion dollars of healthcare spend and readminister that back to patients, families, and communities, and caregivers to improve the quality of life. Right now, um, about a trillion dollars, one third of the cost of healthcare um, is focused on administrative functions. And our role is to use technology to help readminister those dollars to be focused on looking at new drugs that we can use, new therapies, and better ways to provide care to our patients. Um, right now, Olive has uh, about 775 employees. Um, we've grown a lot and we've uh, raised a significant, significant amount of funding to help us to really bring this technology to bear. And we work with everything that you guys work with. So your electronic medical record systems, Epic, Cerner, Metatexone, and so forth. Um, but we also leverage a lot of uh, unique technologies, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and I'll get into the agenda here on the, the core components um, that we're gonna cover today. Um, but essentially we, we look at some of the advanced technologies that are out there in the space today and find the best way to choreograph them to make them practically usable within the operations that you all manage and have um, you know, an acute awareness of the challenges with. We also are healthcare specific, so we do not operate in any other industry. Um, we actually only serve two primary customers, which is our provider base, which is you know, health systems, hospitals, and provider groups. But then also we work on the, the payer side as well, helping to um, uh, reduce administrative burden, um, ultimately impacting the access to care for the patients and the communities that we're serving. And that really runs the gamut, especially in a hospital or health system. Olive can be used in revenue cycles, supply chain, pharmacy, IT, clinical admin, population health, you name it. Um, we have about 1400 unique candidate processes for automation that we've built, designed and deployed within uh, the healthcare ecosystem for providers, health plans, and even uh, some healthcare technology companies. So uh, just to give you the order of magnitude of sort of the work that we do um, that sort of gives me a little bit of the, the viewpoint uh, that allows me to speak in sessions such as this. Um, so in my role, I work across most of our, um, you know, pursuits that we're doing with customers where we're designing new solutions and designing workforce programs where we're looking at assessing their entire operations and identifying areas of opportunity where we can start to introduce technology to help their staff work at top of license and take away some of the transactional work. So that way we can focus on being more analytical, using the data and really creating the agility that a lot of the organizations in our industry really require with some of the challenges that we're looking to face. And with that, we've got about 950 hospitals and health systems that we partner with providing those capabilities to. And right now, logging in at, oh, those 950 hospitals is roughly 40 to 60,000 FTE worth of olives. Olive is a, like an AI worker that logs into the system. So it has the output, the work equivalent of about 40 to 60,000 FTEs every single day, logging into almost a thousand different hospital locations. And it's interacting with a lot of unique information, whether it's claims information or clinical information, depending on the work that Olive might be assigned to at that organization. And we're actually collecting over a terabyte of data a day. Um, Olive sort of has a shared brain across all of her, all of the uh, organizations that she works in, which allows her to, to identify trends and anomalies much more effectively. So when you think about, um, you know, a lot of times when we work with organizations, they have someone that's been in the role for 20, 30 years who knows the tricks of the trade on how to do something. When we're sitting on a petabyte worth of data and collecting over a terabyte of data a day, we can identify the trends in the information a lot faster. So a day of olive working is can be almost like a decade of one of us working today just by the amount of systems and the sheer volume of work that she's accomplishing today which allows us to really enhance the way that this works and um, part of the conversation today I'll, I'll sort of dissect how we think about that and the components that unlock that as a capability um, and through the work that we've done we've we've identified built deployed about 1400 unique processes for automation i'll talk about a couple of those that are probably most common and most impactful for uh, the HFMA group to, to think about or evaluate it if you already haven't, um, haven't already started evaluating those. And what we're seeing in using AI 
as uh, an enterprise technology in a hospital or health system, we're seeing on average that these programs can generate 1% margin improvement based on their net patient service revenue of that organization. So if you're a $1 billion organization, you do the math, there's a significant amount of value that you can drive. And that is true, true margin improvement, just so as you're evaluating new technologies and bringing them into your organization, um, it doesn't always have to be murky with where you find the value. Um, we're seeing that it can be quite significant and I would definitely make sure that you um, evaluate vendors that have some, some proven success in the area or can help guide you to the places that will be most impactful as we're only gonna be cover, covering a handful or two today. So getting over to the agenda, um, this is the topics that I'm gonna cover over the next 49 minutes. Um, so we'll also give some time for question and answer at the end. Um, but we're gonna start off by acknowledging the reality of today. Um, I know someday soon we'll probably have a webinar or presentation that doesn't have some tip of the cap to the challenges that we all felt with COVID, but today is not that day, unfortunately. Um, but it has presented us with a lot of unique opportunities. And so I'm gonna highlight some of the things that are the realities of what we're coming out of and hopefully um, are learning from and how we can apply those learnings to the way we manage our staff, how we think about work in the future and how we can leverage some of those technologies to help us be more effective and, and uh, resilient in the face of a, another challenge like the one we've just uh, made our, our way through or are making our way through. The second topic is we'll be talking about artificial intelligence more broadly. So addressing the hype. Um, I have some studies in here uh, that, that we've done and that we've also um, you know, seen have a, other organizations have done that we've pulled together to kind of highlight some of the issues with um, being the shiny object um, and not having as much practical application in many senses and how to get beyond that. Uh, we'll also take a step here to look at some of the key terms. Um, there are so many acronyms and buzzwords being thrown out and I feel like almost every organization or tool um, has the AI moniker slapped on it in some way or another. So I'm gonna take a few steps back on how I personally have uh, defined some of these terms because um, there's right now definitions and when there's a million definitions, there's essentially no definition. Um, so how I've, I've been able to navigate this, being in the space, talking about it every day with executives at health systems and health plans and how we've, um, allowed ourselves to think of it in a certain way that makes it more tactical and practical to use. So I'll highlight those and, and uh, define a few of the, the key terms that you all might be hearing uh, floating around in conversations you're having today. The third one is um, an extension of the artificial intelligence, but how it's being applied. Um, I'll talk about some of the things that we see a lot of success with, things that when we're talking to a provider, um, we will point them to because we know there's tremendous value out of the almost a thousand hospitals and health systems we've worked with there's really um, uh, a secret, no secret sauce and where there's value, uh, but there's also a, a bit of uh, awareness that needs to be done with uh, change management and how you think about introducing these things and getting your staff ready for changing uh, the way that they think about the work they're doing today. And then finally, we'll end with a little bit of a, a question and answer. So um, before I jump into acknowledging the reality of today, I wanted to share a, a little bit of a story. So um, I think. I, well, it depends, every organization you talk to, when you hear AI, there's, you know, oh, the robots are taking our jobs. And I feel like that often comes in many of the organizations I'm working with. And really what I hope you get out of today is that uh, the technology is here to stay. And really there's so many more advantages than there are disadvantages. Um, I, I like to give the example of back in the late 60s, early 70s, before I was around, um, the ATMs started becoming popular. Um, and actually the first one was um, introduced in, in London in 1967. And uh, it actually didn't get a lot of popularity until the 90s, but there was so much press and um, a little bit of fanfare around the fact that the automated teller machine was directly going after the teller job. And I think if you haven't thought about this or, or read about this before, um, and if you have it, this is probably redundant, but one of the really unique things that actually happened was that there was no negative impact to teller jobs. There was actually a positive impact. There were more teller jobs came out as a result of the automated teller machine being introduced into the banking industry. And the reason for that is because it significantly reduced 
the challenge of opening up a new branch because it went from the, the average rural bank branch required about 21 to 23 associates and tellers to man it. With the automated teller machine, it only required maybe 30. And that actually really reduced the cost of opening new branches. And then what you started seeing happening is that more and more branches were opening. So the need for more and more tellers started to become a reality. But then also what you really started to notice was that they weren't just providing cash services. They started to provide different small business loans. They started to talk about investments and different types of financial vehicles that the community could use. So they started to increase access and increase the amount of services, the needed services for that community. And I can't think of a better industry uh, for that type of uh, evolution to happen to than the one that we're currently in. I would love for every patient to have the access to the care that they need. And even if it's highly specialized care, that that is easier to provide to them in a more cost-effective way. So I wanted to start off with that story um, because we're gonna talk about some of the technology that sometimes can be a little ominous, um, especially if you're not familiar with it. But the goal of today is to familiarize you with it so you can use it as something that really can help you learn and expand the care that you can provide to your community and also help your staff live a more, have a more fulfilling work experience working on the challenges that they want to instead of the things that unfortunately they have to do today because the technology is not there to support them. So um, jumping into the first topic here of acknowledging the reality of today, I'm highlighting a couple of the headlines that we all saw um, you know, in 2020. And one of the unique things about this is that I, I think early on, it almost came in like two waves. There was two waves of uh, the, the chaos from, from my perspective and the way I'm highlighting it is that when COVID first happened um, from an administrative capacity, there is a huge challenge in providing access to testing and understanding where the challenges were. Uh, and then there was a second one uh, when the vaccinations came out and administering vaccinations. And there's a huge administrative um, uh, overload that, that starts to happen in, in those particular areas that made it really challenging for a lot of folks to manage um, the population and provide the types of services that they wanted to. I actually started this um, presentation. So essentially I'll, I'll, I'll come up with a handful of keynotes uh, that I do at some of the regional events. So I, I've had the opportunity to do, to do this one and evolve it as time has gone on as we made our way through the pandemic um, and working through the vaccination distribution and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think really what it's done is shine a light on a lot of different things that allow us to respond either positively or negatively, but move, move forward in a more effective way. So when you look at some of the negatives uh, that we had, obviously, I'm sure you're all familiar as healthcare finance leaders, just the financial impact that this has had um, to most of us. So these are some of the things that um, you know, we're, we've all talked about, even in the care delivery impact perspective, I think we still have yet to scratch the surface on what type of um, undiagnosed challenges are out there in the community for folks that haven't been outside or haven't inter interacted with um, you know, their medical care providers, the delay in elective procedures, and a lot of disruption within just the, the supply chain and the ability to administer care within your community is has, I think, a lot of impacts that we, we have yet to really, really fully understand. Um, and the human impact of this, both from the workforce that you all might be managing today, uh, likely working from home, uh, I'm sure we're all very familiar with the talking heads, which, which I am a talking head right now, um, but there, there definitely is a thing as Zoom fatigue and uh, being inside your house. I, I think of my, my brother, he has two small children. I have no idea how he gets anything done with a one-year-old and a four-year-old in the house. And I couldn't imagine um, the work environment and the type of balance that that would require. And we just haven't had to exercise those muscles before. Um, and so some of those things, I think we still need to be really respectful of the environments that the folks on our teams have um, in the working environments they may not have access to um, and how that might impact things. But also just um, social isolation is one of the biggest challenges when you think about social determinants of health. and. Um, some of the other aspects of that, that that can really be detrimental to someone's well-being. And I highlight all these things as the challenges because what they've actually done is really started to um, bring together some opportunities and they've really started to materialize. So I think now more than ever, so many more people are, are more focused on global health, epidemiology. I know in, in the state of Ohio, um, where I was when the, the pandemic first started was, you know, our governor would get on the TV every so often and talk about um, infection rates and things like that. And that, that type of healthcare awareness and, and folks 
taking into consideration, uh, you know, wearing masks and, and thinking about their health in just a different way, in a, in a global way, and other people's health, thinking about their community's health, um, just weren't things that happened as commonplace as I think they will now, and then there's a greater sense of awareness. Uh, there's also been the interest in, in adopting new delivery models. So a lot of telehealth and digital health services have been distributed, and um, there's been regu regulatory and uh, different types of reimbursement mechanisms there that, that make it as though those, those likely are going to be here to stay. And, and how do we adjust uh, with a flexible model to make sure we're catering to the needs of the community, whether they would rather be there in person or, or not? Um, I think there's been a significant level of convenience because we've had to make it easier for folks to access care in different types of settings. And I don't think that's going away. And then also, when you look at the administrative side of things, um, folks have really been rethinking their real estate uh, investment strategies. Um, I know a number of um, executives that I spoke with that um, have gone fully virtual, have, have no intent to bring folks back into the office. Instead, they're reinvesting in the homes or in, in the communities of where their staff is today to help them have a more comfortable work environment and reducing their um, real estate footprint and reinvesting that money into the, the um, home offices and uh, co-working spaces that may be in an area where there's a, a significant population of co-located workers. Uh, so it's really interesting to see the things that we've all sort of aligned to. And when we're looking at this, uh, you kind of think like, who, who can we lean on to help us get through this? And I really think it's on us. It's, it's me, it's, it's you all um, eating your lunch right now. It's on us to come up and help all of the US healthcare stakeholders work through all of this chaos and, and have it go, um, you know, have us learn from the experience and the challenges that we had to avoid them in the future. So how can we reinforce our healthcare resources, the teams that we have to better capture opportunities to learn from what we've been through, but also what are the examples of other organizations that have had breakthroughs in building the right workforce to take advantage of the intelligence age? There's a significant, you know, when you look at all the challenges that came through this, there's a handful of companies that actually um, did not have, were not as challenged during the pandemic. And I think we can learn something from those organizations. And I actually did a, a quick thought exercise in preparation for this where um, I looked at a couple of healthcare job postings at a number of organizations that you may or may not be familiar with. I haven't shared their information here, but these were the titles and descriptions of roles that I'm sure you all are familiar with. And some of the um, attributes of what they're looking for for these roles on the left side. And then on the right side, I actually looked at um, the current FANG job postings, which FANG I would say is probably some of the most resilient organizations throughout the pandemic. And that's Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Um, so I looked at a similar type of role um, and, and just the difference in how they're categorizing who these folks are, I think is a, a key teller to how we should be thinking about things. So we know that um, the work that we do today and the work our teams are doing today is going to change. We need to start helping prepare them or look for roles that, that fill certain requirements and start to mentally think, what does the role of the future um, of a healthcare finance leader or a revenue cycle leader look like and what types of attributes are those? It's gonna shift from transactional work to analytical thinking, looking at um, information, responding to changes in the data and being more data focused. And you can see that in the way that these different groups of organizations are categorizing a similar body of work. Um, they're on the healthcare revenue cycle side, there's a lot of processing and research. It feels very heavy. Um, and then on the analyst side, there's extracting data and um, you know, developing reports and data sets. It's, it's a lot of heavy manual transactional work where on the other side, you can see that they're implementing new processes. They're um, identifying insights. They're working collaboratively with different stakeholders to solve problems and bigger problems and take a step back rather than getting too deep into the weeds. Um, and oftentimes that's because of a technology enabled environment that allows them to do that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how we can get there, but the goal of this is to leverage data versus brute force. And I think that we are slowly, slowly getting there and there's definitely work that we can do. Um, I mean, for example, this is actually a picture I Googled off of uh, the folks at Yale New Haven Hospital. They have a great um, capacity coordination center there that pulls in information on bed capacity and it shows them real-time data that they have diverse groups of operations leaders, healthcare leaders, so on and so forth, technology leaders that are looking at graphs and charts 
And this was immensely helpful for them to be as agile as they were in responding to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic because um, they could pick their head up and they could look at the problem more holistically to solve for it. And then, you know, on the right side of the screen, I think you all are familiar with a lot of the work settings that we have today. It's a transactional based work where unfortunately we're not being as collaborative. Best practices are, are really hard to distribute across a team. And uh, it can be really challenging to understand trends and anomalies that might be happening from one coworker to the next, as opposed to across a whole swath or body of, of coworkers. So um, that I, I say all that because I think that as you think about how things should be changing in order for us to respond to the environments that we have, and when we think about even the, the story about the ATM, um, we want our teams to be doing more things, more fulfilling work um, that's gonna help our patients and the populations that they serve. Um, but the, the first step is really in understanding uh, artificial intelligence. So right now I'm gonna pull up a couple of these studies um, that you know, there's a lot of growth. Everyone's talking about artificial intelligence. Everyone's developing a strategy. In this study that we've reviewed, um, there's actually about 41% of uh, healthcare organizations have drafted an artificial intelligence strategy. That said, only 7% of those organizations are fully operational or have some work going within their organization. So there's still a long way for us to go. And hopefully some of the points that we talk about today um, will allow you to help your organization accelerate the adoption within the areas that you have, but also do it uh, in the right way. I think one thing I've noticed working across every organization that I've worked with is that it's truly about the people. It starts with helping them understand the technology more fundamentally, and then helping them be a part of that change process, uh, which really helps for successful adoption. And then also when you look at um, uh, the study there's a really interesting, uh, the greatest challenges in AI implementation that folks are feeling is that uh, they have resource and staff constraints. I'm sure this is no different than any other technology implementation we've all had. Uh, there's always resource constraints. And that's why we need to be really thoughtful about what we focus on, which is the second point is there's difficulty in identifying the highest value processes to use for the technology. I think oftentimes folks want to apply the technology because it sounds cool and it's interesting. That may not be the best, you know, a machine learning algorithm may not be the best thing to solve um, problem A, um, but problem B might require it. But you also need to value the, the time and the uh, return value that you can have for those opportunities. So developing a machine learning model, while it sounds very cool and interesting, it needs to produce a significant amount of value back to the organization because it can take a significant amount of time investment and data investment uh, to make that meaningful and impactful and useful. Um, so it's very important to make sure that you look for the right opportunities before just, um, instead of just being a hammer looking for a nail, you gotta make sure you have the nail and then fig figure out which hammer is gonna be most effective in uh, driving the result that you're looking for. So 49% so of the, uh, those automation technologies in place, the ones that have the automation technology in place have less than five use cases. And, and really, I think there's an opportunity to accelerate this if, um, you know, you're working with an organization that knows where to direct you. There's a ton of uh, circling that happens when you're trying to figure out where to apply the technology uh, without having guidance in doing so. And there can be a tremendous amount of value and, and we've produced some materials and there's <clears throat> other folks in the industry that have started to produce some roadmaps that can allow you to be a little more pointed in your evaluation of your own organization uh, to make sure you're not starting from scratch. But at a, at a more basic level, um, you know, artificial intelligence, I define it, uh, I'm sort of a, a Turing purist, if uh, you're not familiar. Alan Turing is one of the, the you know, founding fathers of the current artificial intelligence field. And uh, one of the ways that they define it in a simple, simple way uh, is one that I, I like to use um, because I think I get mired in a lot of the detail of, oh, is this machine learning or deep learning or is it natural language processing or understanding? At a very basic level, when you look at the definition of artificial intelligence, I think about it as a computer doing work in a way that is indistinguishable from their human counterpart. So can I tell the difference between a human doing this work or that a machine is doing this work? If that's indistinguishable to me, I, I will um, highlight that as artificial intelligence. It can be a technology as basic as robotic process automation where it's going off of like, if this, then that sort of statements, and it's mimicking human intelligence. 
Um, it, I don't think it always needs to require the most advanced uh, technology, but we see oftentimes that there's a choreography of multiple different technologies to achieve an outcome uh, that's truly important. And I think that that's really what we should be taking away from this is how can we use technology most effectively? Not that it's machine learning or deep learning or this particular piece of this field uh, that really makes it fit what it needs. So um, when we look at where we are today, uh, there's a sort of three fields. There's narrow AI, there's broad AI, and then there's general artificial intelligence. Narrow AI is um, exactly that, small replicable human tasks that are as point solutions within a larger system of work being done. Uh, the second one is sort of where I feel like we are today. It's a collection of narrow AI solutions that can replicate an end-to-end -end process. And we'll talk about a couple examples of that today. And then the general artificial intelligence is uh, really where you start to think about the Terminator and uh, where you know there's actually replicating human intellect, uh, reading of emotions, some of those things that are still very, very uh, far into the horizon for us to um, identify. Um, and the terms in this ecosystem are constantly evolving. So I wanted to take an example of breaking this down um, in the example of a broad AI, which again is a collection of narrow AI solutions that can replicate an entire process. So what I was going to um, highlight is an example between um, Netflix, which I'm sure is an organization a lot of us um, had you know, a good familiarity with over the pandemic. Um, and then also an example that's specific to the revenue cycle um, for this group as well. So again, broad AI is a collection of narrow AI solutions that, to replicate an entire process. So it's a, all about leverage and scale. Um, it's about using technology in the areas that can serve up information to the people in the place at the right time to make them much more together so they can focus on higher value work. In the example with Netflix around their way of content creation and distribution, it's very interesting how they can serve up things. There's intuitive content catalog and curation. So a when you go onto Netflix, you can seemingly, you know, intuitively make your way through, find shows that you like, find movies that you like, and you can actually, um, you know, select them, view them by categories and different things. But what that actually allows them to do is understand what you like. And then what ends up happening behind the scenes, they use technology to provide thoughtful suggestions to you based on the habits the shows that you're watching. Um, maybe your kids are watching a lot of cartoons on your account. You're gonna start seeing a lot more cartoons pop up because they're, they're monitoring and understanding what you like and what you've selected and what you've watched. And, and that's all technology enabled that allows them to scale that and provide a better experience for you. And then also what they end up doing is optimizing uh, resource uh, allocation. They, they might look across, um, so they're providing a best practice to you an individual best practice on recommending you more cartoons because you like cartoons. But what they're looking at is across all of the technology that they have, all of the users that they have. Uh, wow, we're seeing an uptick that everyone's watching a lot more cartoons. Let's maybe make some investments in this area and allocate some resources to producing more, better cartoons. Um, and it's all thoughtful response to the data as opposed to punching the transactional work through. When you automate those things, you can identify the trends in the information and the anomalies and the things that you should be paying attention to much faster to allow you to use your resources more effectively. And then when, what ends up happening is they have a full portfolio that they manage and doing new content creation. And then they can actually nudge you um, with the, the cybernetics is a really interesting um, phase. And we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, when we talk about how AI is being applied. But Cybernetics is essentially the it's a science that has been around for a long time about understanding and improving the interaction between human and machine. Um, and these are things where they make nudges to you to help you utilize the system better or more effectively. In the example here, they're, you know, are you still watching? And you can continue binge watching um, several seasons of your favorite show. So when you think about using these small little pieces of technology introduced to help make better decisions along the way, um, in Netflix, which we um, likely use, most of us likely use in, in uh, maybe our daily lives still. And uh, when you apply it to HFMA and, and even a revenue cycle scenario, there are so many things that we can all do 
that if we just had um, the right technology can help make a, help us make better decisions and provide a better experience, just like the one that you get with Netflix. So in this example, you know, there's a lot of patient self-service and scheduling that's out there today. Um, some of it is more uh, easy to navigate than others. Uh, but what you can start to do is understand the intent of your patients. And you should be looking at the data to say what types of, not, not that they always, when they complete a scheduling or some type of self-service event, whether it's a prescription refill or whatever it might be, uh, you should be looking at the data that helps you understand their intent, even if they didn't complete the task. So then you can start to say, wow, we had um, X amount of people going through prescription refills. Only 10% of them actually completed it. What can we do to reduce that to help them successfully achieve that event in the future? And then what ends up happening is someone schedules an appointment. Uh, they're going to see a doctor or a specialist for some type of procedure. And then you can actually um, automatically use technology to see, does that scheduled visit actually require an authorization uh, for this patient based on the uh, insurance provider that they have, the type of service that they've scheduled themselves for? And then you can actually use technology to use natural language processing, natural language understanding to evaluate uh, and make sure that there's the appropriate clinical criteria to match the medical necessity requirements for the authorization and automatically submit that. You can already start to see, based on those things, how you can optimize your resource allocation. Uh, you can make sure that staff isn't working on things where an auth is not required, or you can have them work on more complex cases where uh, the AI is not able to pull back the irrelevant information. So it might say, we've satisfied five out of six of the medical necessity criteria. Now your staff is reallocated to focusing on satisfying that last requirement or finding that last piece of documentation to help us have a best, better first pass yield to make sure we don't have to reschedule that patient and them having a poor experience. And then also, then you can start to look at even more broadly, take a step back. You can optimize your AR, AR portfolio to make sure your staff is actually focused on the things that have the highest net return. You're actually having a better first pass uh, rate as you're passing things through. And, and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and um, you, know, you can use cybernetics to help suggest things to your staff on, by understanding who's doing the work. You can see who works these types of claims better and who has more a higher success rate. We're gonna tee these types of claims up to this person in the future uh, to help us optimize where our strengths are. And all of this is enabled by using data versus brute force. Um, just having work cues where you're funneling work with the same group of staff um, you, without identifying productivity and success of certain staff members makes it really challenging to find the right ways to introduce them uh, into environments that will allow them to be more successful and you more successful as a whole. So um, another thing I wanted to do uh, after that example was talk about uh, some of the complexity. These are just, I put these up here because there's so many, I feel like I just like, this is the, the amount of buzzwords I would hear, conceptual frameworks, example terms that I hear on a weekly basis. And a lot of times it's difficult uh, for us to have strong definitions for any of these to know how and when and where they should be used. I put these here so you can do some self-education um, at some point. I'm not going to go through and define each of these and help uh, you know, form an opinion on exactly what's important on this list. But I, I wanted to highlight a couple that I think are really important when you're talking about artificial intelligence. Um, underneath the, the larger umbrella of artificial intelligence, there's sort of two core components. And there's a couple of different subdivisions under that that I wanted to orient you to just to give you a little bit of awareness and some of the things that are probably most prominent. At the bottom, I've highlighted a couple of different types of machine learning that exist. If you wanted to go and um, look these up or understand, I'm gonna provide a list of resources. HFMA is, is a great um, resource as well. And um, there's also an ex in the middle, a couple of example products that exist that may be using some of these technologies that you can start to orient yourself with just beyond the definition about real application. And then there's also an example of a handful of platforms at the bottom that I would recommend digging into because the more we know, the more we can help our staff understand and the better off we are in utilizing and evaluating the technology. So it's less of a black box. It's not going anywhere and it can be tremendously powerful. Um, so on the machine learning side on the left side of the screen, uh, under machine learning, there's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Um, supervised learning is where we're actually helping uh, to provide um, the information to a machine learning model based on known examples and testing its ability to match those examples. On an unsupervised learning model, um, that's where we're leveraging based on unknown examples. So in a supervised example, 
we might say, when we get these denials, we know how to repeal the, we know how to um, appeal those denials and get paid on them. So we'll train the model based on the ones we got paid on. So then we can actually have it replicate the decision-making process that happens. When we get this denial, it knows to do this because we trained it with data that allows it to, that, that reach the outcome that we were looking for. In an unsupervised learning model, uh, while we're training the machine learning model, we'll use data where we don't have examples of what we were looking for to hopefully identify things that will help us understand uh, and have the machine learning model make the appropriate decisions in the right areas. Um, so that way we can use the machine learning model to help identify um, the outcome that we're looking for. On the right side of the screen, uh, we're looking at deep learning. Um, and when we think about deep learning, there's a couple of different ways to do this. There's a, there's a lot um, of nuance into these. So I'm giving high level, very uh, brief descriptions of some of the technology. And I'm gonna reference a few materials that you all can use to, to learn a few levels deeper as um, there can be some complexity and nuance based on how you're looking at applying the technology. But in a deep learning model, um, I think one of the, the best ways to identify or reconcile reinforcement learning um, is where it, it adapts learning based on feedback. Um, and that's really where we're giving it, um, nudging it in the right direction when it's reaching, the, when it's going in the right direction or uh, negatively reinforcing it if it's going in the wrong direction for what we're looking to accomplish. And all of this requires a, a tremendous amount of data. Um, you can think about this more simply as, um, I mentioned earlier, my brother's at home working with two small children. Um, I think of supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning um, as uh, his toddler walking around in the kitchen. Supervised learning would probably be the example where he goes, this is the stove, don't touch it, it's hot. Unsupervised learning, um, we're not really providing much direction there. We're letting the toddler figure out his way through the kitchen on his own. Reinforcement learning would be when the toddler walks to the kitchen and he touches the hot stove, he learns it's hot and he doesn't do that again. Um, so that's a very simple way to think about some of these more complicated um, ways to evaluate data to help machines make decisions in a way that's indistinguishable from a, a human counterpart. Um, like I said, there's a ton of opportunities for self-directed learning. Uh, LinkedIn Learning has some great courses, YouTube, HFMA. There's university courses that have become available on this. So there's no reason why uh, all of us can't be experts in understanding this um, and instead waiting for the vendors and the folks that we're talking to to educate us. We can all become self-aware and I would definitely encourage you all and uh, you'll have access to these resources as well as a follow-up. Uh, some of the lessons learned uh, as you begin to explore this, one, make sure you really understand your problem. Um, don't just think about using the technology, but understand the problem understand the resources. Is it worth it to dedicate my time, energy, effort, my staff's time, energy, and effort into this? And then also understand your options. Uh, do you want a service? Do you want to have, do you want to take this and build it and manage it on your own? Do you want someone else to do that? Um, I think there's a, a lot of unique opportunities in this space with it becoming a, a very interesting uh, business opportunity and opportunity just in general but there's a lot of companies that do a lot of different approaches here that you can really understand what your organization really needs to be successful and make sure you select the right partner um, for those opportunities. Now, lastly, I know we're um, about 15 minutes out. Um, I'm hoping you guys are on the bag of chips and to finish your sandwich, because uh, we're gonna talk about how artificial intelligence is being applied today. And this is gonna be a little bit more tactical um, for you all, and I'd, I'd love to also get any questions that you might have. So feel free to pop anything into the chat um, and we'll, go, we'll jump right into this. So this is a little bit thinking about how um, at Olive we've dissected the work and how we think about applying artificial intelligence within a hospital or a health system that we're doing today. And so we think about it in uh, mostly 90% of uh, the opportunities that we're working with in organizations is one, uh, freeing up capacity. So when we think about what folks are doing today, using the technology uh, to take on work that no longer needs to be done by human staff. So human staff can focus on higher value work. So that's one thing, taking the work away from the human staff to free them up to do things that they couldn't do before. All too often we're going into organizations where there's work queues that have no end in sight. Um, and there's never enough folks to actually get all of the work done that they need. And then on the second side of this, there's the augmentation piece. Again, the cybernetics where it's optimizing the interaction between human and machine. And that's where what we call Olive Helps 
And this is where we're turning human workers into superhuman workers. So when this human is required to do a function, what we wanna do is have Olive help that person do their job much more effectively. Hey, I noticed you're scheduling this procedure. That actually requires an authorization. Would you like me to submit that for you? That type of an interaction that allows you to have a much more seamless experience and use your staff much more effectively and help the staff have the right tools to do their job more effectively. So that's how we think about it is the back office, the automation work. So that way we can take on the, the transactional work that staff doesn't need to do anymore, but then also optimizing the work that the human staff is doing. When we look at the opportunities that are out there, it's vast. Um, I mentioned we have about 1400 candidate processes for automation, um, unique candidate process for automation that spans the gamut. I would say there's a significant amount of them in the revenue cycle. Um, so happy to share with you all a more detailed list, but I wanted to show a couple of the highlights of some of the top examples around um, that we're seeing most organizations that we partner with, starting with that have high value for them. So anything around claims management, so that's statusing, denial management, um, and anything around sort of that, that claims process and submission. Um, authorizations, eligibility, insurance verification. Uh, I, I bucket coverage discovery in there as well. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. And as I had mentioned before, what we're seeing in most of our programs is that we're identifying, targeting, and delivering about 1% to 0.75% of their net patient service revenue of margin impact. So you can do some quick sizing. And that as an average, that's, that's a, a full gamut of different types of providers that we've seen that across from very large academic medical centers to uh, smaller community-based organizations that seems to be about the average. So uh, hopefully a good sizing opportunity for you all as you look at your organization where, we, where you can likely um, see a, a savings opportunity or a revenue improvement uh, opportunity within the first year. One of the examples I wanted to highlight briefly, um, I talked about the example where we did the side-by-side -side with uh, Netflix and HFMA revenue cycle more broadly. We talked about broad AI. And again, it's a series of narrow AI applications or point solutions that are sort of choreographed together to complete an end-to-end -end process. Uh, one that I think um, you all might be familiar with is, uh, and it's been a challenge for a lot of organizations, is a, a prior authorization. Um, so there, that process can be completely automated and end-to-end. -end. And then you can also think about Olive or any um, AI technology you might be using in this space. One of the really interesting things about this type of technology is that it doesn't, it's not done. Uh, it, it's always learning and evolving. So it's not like, oh, we implemented it, we're live, we're good. There's always, and it should never be that way. Um, so I would definitely be uh, critical of any uh, vendors that you're evaluating where um, it, it's sort of a, a big bang and everything's done. You should always be optimizing the work. Your, your AI workforce should be getting smarter and better just like your human workforce does. Someone who's been working in that job for uh, two months versus two days is gonna be better at it. And it should be the same way that you think about your technology. Um, so over time, as even in the authorization process that I'm outlining here, there's several components that are some narrow AI point solutions that you can choreograph together to take on an entire end-to-end -end process. And then as you optimize it, it can actually take on more and more work. And we're seeing this have significant value for the partners we work with. Um, so as soon as the doctor puts in an order, um, we have AI that goes out and checks to see if an authorization is required based on the insurance information that that patient has, the type of procedure, and all the critical criteria to evaluate that. If and when an authorization is actually required, we have uh, machine learning models that are trained with 40,000 different payers, rules and medical necessity criteria for the types of procedures that they would be funneling through the system. And we actually identify what is the medical necessity criteria for this. And then we have another AI that will actually, an olive that will log into the system and pull all of the relevant clinical information using natural language processing and natural language understanding to read through 12 to 18 months worth of clinical information. So that way we can find the documents and the uh, information that's available that would satisfy the medical necessity criteria and serve that up to someone to say, hey, here we found these, th these are the documents that satisfy the medical necessity criteria. Do you, you know, here, here this is, do you agree or disagree? Or if there's an opportunity where maybe we're missing a piece of information, this is where we're really augmenting the human. We're helping the human uh, do superhuman work by doing everything leading up to this so they can make a judgment decision that only a human can make. But then over time, what we can start to do 
is if we see that the AI is doing really, really well and the human's always approving. We can always just have uh, the AI auto submit in those cases where we have a high, high confidence level. Um, and then, you know, on the back end, we can have uh, AI go out and actually uh, submit and then track till that reaches a determination. And what we've actually seen is a significant value for some of the partners that we've implemented this with about a 60% reduction in their write-offs, 35% reduction in the staffing requirements. And it went from a, um, you know, a little over a week to just a few days um, for uh, obtaining authorizations for a significant portion of their procedures. And um, we also have recently uh, done a, a webinar where we've actually worked with um, a, a large payer in the Florida market, which we're expanding that relationship to other organizations in other states where uh, we actually have AI on the, the payer side that helps with the utilization management side where we can actually auto adjudicate. So as soon as the doctor orders a procedure for a patient, that patient can leave there knowing that their services are gonna be covered and schedule their procedure without having to wait two to 10 days based on um, the, the prior authorization process. We can do point of service authorization for patients, which is tremendous and unlocks a, a tremendous amount of potential for point of service authorizations that um, increases access to care, um, very needed care for a lot of the patients and populations that we all serve. So just a, a little tip of the cap to how you can deploy the technology in a truly meaningful way. I think a lot of times we get stuck in, in all the process that we're, we're focused on and um, really it's about the patient and helping them get the services that they need. And um, a couple of the things that I wanted to highlight as I open it up to question and answer is the top reasons why AI and automation programs fail is because of uh, poor governance. And I, I say that because there's one, uh, as a leader within your organization who may be governing some of these processes or technologies into your organization, you need to understand the technology. And I think that's really critical. So hopefully you take me up on some of the resources I've shared. Um, also, the second one is uh, poor maintenance. I, I think, uh, like I mentioned, the AI requires a lot of care and feeding to get to, to get better and do better. And it has the tremendous opportunity to, to improve at a rate of speed much faster than you or I could just based on the amount of data that it's um, evaluating. So make sure you focus on it. It's not just one and done. Uh, once it's live, that's really where the work becomes and can be even more meaningful to put time, energy, and resources into it. The third one is insufficient change management. Um, it's really important to work with your team you know, one, you must be educated on the technology and how you're bringing it into your organization because it's not going anywhere. But you also need to help your staff understand how this is going to impact their work, have them be a part of the journey, have them support uh, the journey. The, in, in most cases where uh, we're clear and upfront on introducing the technology, we set up workshops with the staff to help them understand the technology. They are more excited than ever to bring Olive in as their coworker to help them do their job better and provide better care to the patients, the communities that they serve, which is the reason why all of us got into this industry. Um, it's not to sit there and crunch numbers and work in an endless work queue that feels like every time you come back to work, there's 10 times more accounts for you to work and there's no end to uh, the work in front of you. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to have our associates be uh, lock arms with us in, in this transformation and really can embrace it to make it more meaningful and successful. And a lot of times that, that comes with goal setting and competition, really exciting opportunities to get educated and, and work with exciting new technology uh, that all of us will probably be interacting with for the very, very long term. And then the fourth one is inaccurate expectations. I think there's uh, a lot of uh, exciting hype around this technology. Um, I highlighted some realistic numbers of what we're seeing within organizations, obviously, those um, can differ, uh, results may vary uh, by organization. So I think one thing that, that you do is you start to bring this up to leaders in your organization or technology in your environment, you need to manage expectations um, down to your staff. Um, things aren't just gonna be like a flip of a switch night and day different. Uh, these machine learning models and, and things need to learn and get better over time. And they need to understand that it's not just gonna completely change the way everything works one day, um, but also up as well. Um, the financial value and the things that, the, the value is out there, um, but sometimes depending on the type of technology or projects you start with, the time horizon for achieving those benefits can be further out or closer to. 
So as you're as you're selecting vendors and, and problems to solve, I would definitely keep that in mind um, and, and both manage up and down uh, from an expectation standpoint. So I know um, we've got about five minutes left. I am happy to open it up to any question and answers. Hopefully we didn't have anyone fall asleep in their soup or anything during lunch, but I appreciate you all joining me today. This was this was great. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Hey, Jessica. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for all that great information. Um, I just want to take a second to remind everybody that there is a link to the um, slides in the top part of the chat. So if you want to scroll up there, go to that link, that'll give you a chance to download them if you didn't get them via email earlier today. We will also have the um, presentation as a replay posted to our website and on our YouTube page if you want to review it again or share it with anyone. I believe Matt's contact info is included in the presentation. So if you download that and you have any additional questions or want to reach out for anything at all, I'm sure Matt would be happy to speak with you later. Um, let's see, I am not seeing anything in the chat now, so. Nice, I must have uh, answered all your questions. Prior. You must have been perfectly thorough. So um, I just wanna thank you so Matt for, or thank you so much, Matt, for giving us your time today. Um, and that concludes our webinar for today. We'll give everybody three, three minutes back in their day. Um, we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, bye.